Look at a, a whole chapter today and uh, uh, be running right through it. We are in our verse by verse study through the book of Second Peter. We find ourselves this morning in Second Peter chapter two. So if you would make your way there. Yeah, you know, last week, if you were here with us, we talked about a couple monumental moments in the life of Jesus and today, or excuse me, in the life of Paul. Who's this guy we're studying? Peter, that (laughs) other guy. Can I just start over? Worship team, can I have you guys come back up here? No. I want to remind you of an encounter that Peter had with Jesus in John chapter 21. In John 21, this is after the arrest of Jesus, after his crucifixion, after his resurrection. And of course, for Peter, that means it's after his denial of Jesus that the Lord unexpectedly meets them. There, the disciples are out fishing and they come to shore and there's Jesus Uh, unexpectedly. If you remember, Peter, he just jumped out of the boat and started running through the water, and the Lord had made breakfast for him. Well, following breakfast, there's this incredibly powerful moment that ministered to Peter, and the Lord restores him following that denial. And And Jesus asked him, he said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And we don't know exactly what the these is that he's talking about. It's, it could be the occupation, you know, you're a fisherman, here you are, back out on the water. Maybe it's this 153 fish that you just caught, or, or maybe, again, as Peter liked to proclaim that he loved the Jesus and would follow him more than the other disciples. Maybe that's what Jesus is referring to. Do you love me more than these? Whatever it, that, that, that these is, Peter's response was, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus responded to that and said, then feed my lambs. Well, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And it says that Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This was an incredibly impacting time in the life of Peter because Peter And everyone else knew he denied Jesus three times. And here, Jesus restores him three times and commissioned him to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. And so that's the commissioning that Peter had from the Lord. You've been restored, Peter. You've denied me, but I've restored you. And now I'm calling you to shepherd to pastor. That's what the word pastor means. It means to shepherd, to to feed my sheep, to tend my sheep. And so he was to give the church, to give Christians Bible teaching and instruction, create an environment where they could grow and become healthy. But he was also not only to feed, as Jesus says, but to tend. Now, part of tending is to protect and to warn. In 1 Peter, Uh, He wrote to encourage suffering Christians that were facing persecution to stand strong in the midst of that. But here in 2 Peter, he writes to warn. He writes to protect, to identify and expose false teachers that made their, their way within the church. And this is part of the job of a shepherd. It's part of the job of a pastor is to not just feed the flock, but to warn and protect the flock. You know, over and over again in the scripture, the Bible refers to us Christians as sheep. And, and sheep, how many of y'all have had sheep before? There's probably quite a few of us that have raised sheep. Sheep are stupid. Can I hear an amen to that? So you, okay, yeah. They're also fairly de- defenseless, right? They don't have a lot of, you know, 
avenues in which to protect themselves. And so uh, by nature, that's the way they are. And they need the protection. They need the guidance. They need to be tended, not just fed, but they need to be tended by a shepherd. Now, if you can imagine, those of you who have had sheep, if you uh, uh, can imagine a shepherd that would go out and feed them every day, he'd break open some bales for them, made sure they had water, getting them nice and big and fat and healthy, right? But he never, ever guarded them from predators. What good is that? A shepherd that only feeds but doesn't protect, all he's doing is is fattening them up for the kill. What he's actually doing is making them a more attractive target for the wolves. He's thinking, oh, I'm just going to feed them. I'm just going to feed them, but never protecting, never warning. He's not doing anything to protect them. And that's not Peter. Peter has his commission from the Lord. I'm not only to feed, I'm to tend the Lord's sheep. And that's exactly what he does here in chapter 2. Now, we're going to outline, uh, we're going to put this on the screen, and we're going to outline this chapter kind of this way. It's a, it's a tough chapter to outline if you take notes. Uh, it's the conduct of false teachers, verses 1 through 3, the condemnation of false teachers, verses 4 through 9, the characteristics of those false teachers in 10 and 11, comparisons to false teachers, 12 to 17, communication of the false teachers, 18 to 20, and then Peter's conclusion. That's a lot for us to go through. Even the outline takes a little while to reiterate back to you. But really, uh, Peter, his heart here is to, as I said, to warn and protect. And, And so really, you could just write two columns if you wanted to. Instead of getting down all those points, now that you're like, well, I'm halfway through getting these down, and now you're telling me I don't have to. But you could really just say, here's the distinctives of the false teachers, and here's their destiny. Here's some facts about them, some identifiers, some things that are true about them, but here's where they're going to end up. Here's their destiny. And that's really what this chapter is about. He, he, he'll talk about a characteristic, a, the conduct of false teachers, and then explain, hey, here's why that we need to be warned about this. And so he, he's, uh, let's, we're going to pick up in chapter one of this so we can get a run at it, and we're going to see why uh, in, a, in a minute. But in verses 16 through 18, we looked at the first part of this, of, uh, the last part of chapter one last week, and uh, it's this monumental moment in Peter's life at the transfiguration in verse 16, 17, and 18, where he says, I was an eyewitness to glory. (laughs) I heard the Father. I was with Jesus up on the mountain. I heard the Father booming from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I saw Jesus, man, from the inside out, just shining. His face shone like the sun, right? But he says, as valid as that testimony is, that my experience, which was incredible, As true as that was, we have something better, he says in verse 19. And this verse is really pivotal in understanding the theme of kind of the whole book, right? It says, we have the prophetic word confirmed, or as the King James would put it, we have the more sure word of prophecy. He says, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We would agree. We live in a dark time. And Peter says, because we do, pay attention to the prophetic word, to the word of God. He says, don't just take my word about Jesus and the Father's voice that I heard. You need to go to the word, look at the prophecies, dive into the Bible. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, didn't have his origin In the will of man, verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke, these prophets, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter says the word of God is true. It's to be a beacon in this dark and gloomy, miserable world that we live in. It's the word, the word, the word. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It's shining there for us because it's not man's word. It's God's word delivered by prophets. He moved men to write it, verse 2, but there were also, or chapter 2, there are also false prophets. Again, Peter didn't write this big two in here, right? This is all flowed together. God spoke, but not only did God speak, there's false speakers, false prophets among the people, even as there will be 
false teachers among you. Now, when I'm reading this through, the first word in that sentence that strikes me, or this part of a sentence, is the word false, right? There's false prophets. That's a, that's a harsh, hard, heavy-hitting word. There's false prophets, false teachers. It says they've been in the past, they're going to be in the future. But the second word that sticks out to me is the word among. They're here. They won't just be out there. That's one thing if they were just out there. But Peter says they're going to make their way in here, within the church, within God's people. And so the first thing that I want to point out to you when we talk about the conduct of false teachers is that they're among the church. Peter says as long as there's been true teaching, there will be false teaching. There's going to be pretend, fake, unreal, untruthful teachers, and they are going to be among you. They are always going to be among God's people. As long as there is truth being proclaimed, there will be falsehood being proclaimed. And this is exactly what Jesus warned us on the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew 7, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Jesus himself says, Be aware, beware. There are those that seem like they're sheep outwardly, but inwardly, the real them is they're wolves. They look like sheep, but they're actually coming to devour the flock. That's their intent. That's their purpose. Now, one of the ways that you can tell a wolf from a sheep is by what they eat. Wolves and sheep eat drastically different things, right? A sheep wants to be in the pasture. It wants the living water. It just wants the green grass. Wolves eat sheep. They chew up on sheep. They're coming down on the sheep. They're always chewing them up. That's one way to tell a wolf from a sheep. And so, and so uh, Peter's heart here is the Lord's heart. It's to warn. This is going to happen. It's going to be among you. Paul knew it was going to happen. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is saying farewell to the Ephesian elders. He's no, he knows that this is the last time he's going to see him. He has this tearful goodbye on the shore of Miletus there in Acts chapter 20, an amazing passage. And it says there that he tells these, these elders, these pastors, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, it's one level of urgency. If, you, if you're those who have had sheep, you don't have to even be you know, a shepherd to get this. But if you, if you have a, a sheep pen, there's a level of urgency if there is a wolf standing on the other side of that fence. It is right there. But it is a completely different level of urgency when the wolf is in the actual pen. And that's what Paul's saying. That's what Peter's saying. It's going to happen. He goes on and says, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. The, these false teachers, he said, they're going to be among you. These wolves are going to make their way into and among God's people, but not, to, but not to draw people to the Lord. They're going to draw people to themselves. They're going to be about not building God's kingdom, but their own kingdom. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, that's how long he was with them. For three years, I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. This is serious, the Apostle Paul would say. This wolves among the sheep, it brought him to tears. I know this is going to happen. I know that as long as there's sheep, there's going to be wolves that are going to come and try to pick them off. I know that's the reality. And so he tells these elders, these pastors, watch out, warn the sheep, watch out for the sheep, protect them, tend them. One of the reasons that I believe today that sheep get picked off is because pastors are not watching out for the sheep. They're not warning the sheep. Now this, this may seem like a silly illustration, but imagine a parent from the time that their kid is just learning how to walk, that every time that that kid fussed or complained or cried, I just give him an ice cream bar. <laughs> it's just, that's easier. Let's make him happy. 
And so they're learning to walk and they scrape their palms or whatever. I just, no, stop crying. Here's an ice cream bar. A little older, I don't want to put on my shoes. Well, here's an ice cream bar. Chris won't let me play with my to- his toys. Here's an ice cream bar. Will that make you happy? I don't want to eat my dinner. Here, have an ice cream bar instead. If you can just imagine that outrageous example, it's, it's borderline child abuse. A parent that doesn't want to do the hard work of saying no. The hard work of disciplining. The hard work of training and teaching. Because they would rather have their kids. It's just easier. It's just easier to have my kids happy. And now I'd rather have that than have them healthy. That takes more work. But that's exactly what too many churches today are doing. Every week, week after week, feeding them what amounts to an ice cream bar. More concerned about the sheep just leaving happy and dropping stuff in the box than healthy. I, I really have a hard time understanding, you know, how did, was Jesus praying to himself? I don't understand his godhood. Oh, let me just, we'll just give you an ice cream message. Here's an encouraging word. Here's a feel-good message. But my marriage is, is really struggling. Here's a happy, feel-good message. I'm, I'm struggling to forgive this person. I have this addiction. Here's a feel-good message. And people walk out the door happy, but they won't be healthy. But whether you're a parent or a pastor or a teacher, if you, if you have people in your care, you have an obligation not only to feed them, but to protect them and warn them. That's Peter's heart. I'm not just going to throw ice cream bars out there. I'm going to do the hard work, the uncomfortable. I'm going to give you an uncomfortable message because I also need to tend you. I need to warn you and protect you. And so he's fulfilling his calling. And again, he says in verse 1, there will be false teachers among you. Excuse me. Who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. The second thing that Peter points out, number one, they're among you, but secondly, he points out they're secretive. He'll say in verse three, they have deceptive words. Bible scholar John Darby said this, the devil is never more satanic than when he carries a Bible. They're subtle, They're deceptive. They take the truth and twist it. Maybe even sometimes it's it's well-intentioned, but sooner or later they start saying things that are contrary to the word of God. And it, it can be tricky. It can be hard to decipher because so often they use the same vocabulary. They'll talk about forgiveness and grace and atonement and mercy, and they'll just use all these Bible words, these Christianese type words that we hear, right? But they, they're using the same words, but they have a different uh, definitions. They have a different dictionary. They don't define those words the same way we do. And it, it can be hard. And the, there's even self-deception that takes place. Again, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Did, weren't we preaching in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Have we done many wondrous works in your name? And then Jesus says, and I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There's this group that's going to proclaim in Jesus' name. They're going to do the miraculous. And Jesus is going to say, I I never never knew you. Man, so they're, number one, they're among the church. Number two, they're seductive, they're secretive, deceptive, subtle, even deceiving themselves. And then number three, as we read, among other heresies, they they deny the sovereignty of Jesus. Peter says they deny the sovereign Lord that bought them. They deny his lordship, that he's the master, his nature, his character, who he is. They deny the fact that he's the one that, that bought them, that paid the price on the cross for their salvation. They make salvation about what you can do, not what about the Lord has done for you. Again, this is another commonality among cults. 
Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, every single cult will make Jesus less than God Almighty across the board. And that's what Peter says here. They're denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Number four, in verse two, they're popular. Many will follow their destructive ways. That's a scary verse to me right there too. Many, right? Jesus said, broad is the way. There's not going to be a few people that follow after that nut job out there, right? No, they're going to be popular. They're going to have many followers, a, a big groundswell of people. And, and we see that today. We see popular teachers that teach health. God wants you healthy all the time. And wealthy, he wants you wealthy. He wants to be rich beyond your imagination. He wants, and you're okay no matter what you're involved in. There isn't really right and wrong. God's happy with you no matter what. Truth is whatever you make it. All very popular things. Who doesn't want to hear that, that God wants them healthy and wealthy and to have everything they want? But Peter says that type of teaching Many will follow it, but it leads to destructive. That's their destructive ways. And because of whom, number, this is number five, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of these guys, truth is blasphemed. It's maligned. It's railed against, reviled. The truth is, 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 is treated with contempt. Oh, this classical orthodoxy, biblical, historical Christianity, man, that's so archaic and old-fashioned that all the truth is contained in that book. Come on, man. We live in the 21st century. Man, the malign, the blaspheme, the truth. It's destructive, he says. Verse 3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Peter's just kind of Wang, bang, bang. Here is all, here's the conduct of these guys. And this is number six. They're looking to exploit you. They'll, they'll use Christians for their own personal gain. And this, this word exploit is, is a unique word. It means to use deception as a means to make money. That's what false teachers will do. They'll use deception for their own financial gain. I looked up a website just last night of a popular TV ministry. And it said that if you give financially, you can expect your own financial harvest. Again, just using biblical words and terms to help it feel better, you know, just feeding your own appetite for flesh. And it said that the ministry's anointing will be, have an overflow and operate into your own life. If you give to us, you know, you can't have that. You're not going to have the anointing in your life unless you give to us. And so they'll, they'll merchandise their followers. You know, if you buy this handkerchief that we've prayed over for $25, you know, you're, then we'll be praying for you when you're praying. And, or, you know, just send us $100. I, I believe maybe the Lord is telling somebody out there right now for a $100 gift. Or who's got a $1,000 gift? Or, or I believe that there's five people in the congregation right here today, maybe out there on TV, on the internet, watching me right now. Five people that want to give 10,000, neat, oh, the Lord's prompting you, $10,000 of seed money to start this new year off right. Oh, my goodness. That kind of trash is out there. And the desire is not to feed and tend the flock, but to fleece the flock. And guys, there is not much that angers the Lord more. Jesus made a, a whip made out of cords, and chased people off of the Temple Mount, which is a big, wide area. If you can see Jesus with the whip, chasing people, overturning tables. And he did it because they were making merchandise. They were exploiting the people. They're trying to get rich off of those who are genuinely trying to worship. And I got to tell you, if you can imagine Jesus with a whip chasing you, and that's, you're, you're not doing something right in ministry if that's you know, your interaction with Jesus. But I've got uh, four kids, they're all adults now, three of them sitting right here. But even though they're adults, you mess with one of these three and four, even though he's not here, you mess with one of those, 
man, you, you mess with the bull, you get the horns, right? You're, you're going to be messing with me as well. That's part of the territory. And every dad in here that is a dad is going to say the exact same thing. You don't mess with my kids. And that's how God feels about you. You're his kids. You don't mess with God's kids. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, whoever causes one of these little ones that believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him. Imagine where this is the better scenario. You know what would be the better for you? is if you tied a millstone, this huge stone around your neck, and threw you into the sea. Jesus said, that's better than messing with one of my kids. And so Peter, that's what he points out here in the last part of verse 3. He says, for a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. False teachers, next, deserve the judgment, the destruction that's coming. He said in verse 1 it would be a, it'd be a swift destruction. Here he says it's not going to slumber. The, the idea behind these, these two is that God is long-suffering right now. He's patient. He's, he has created an environment and room and given opportunity for repentance. But if that the repentance doesn't happen, judgment will be swift. It will be certain. There's no turning it back. And to prove this point now, he says that, that, this, that false teachers deserve destruction, that their condemnation is certain. Peter looks at three examples of when God judged the ungodly. Verse 4, for God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And... Next example, he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And example three, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. God is loving. That's true, but he's also righteous. And with that righteousness comes judgment, and he is just in his judgment. And so these three examples, the fallen angels, and it's a reference to Genesis chapter 6, if you're not familiar, you can read that later. But he, he casts those fallen angels down to hell. Example two, the ancient world, the ungodly world in the time of, of Noah, wiped them out completely, except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their daughters. And then the third example, the perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah. It condemned them to destruction, just sparing Lot and his, his daughters. And Peter's point here is, it's pretty straightforward. If God judged angels for leading people astray and causing corruption, if he judged the ancient world for leading people astray, if he judged Sodom and Gomorrah for leading people astray, he's going to judge the false teachers who lead his kids away in the church. It's going to happen. God doesn't wink at sin. There's consequences for this. It would be better to have a millstone tied in your neck and thrown into sea. There's consequences for manipulating and exploiting his kids. He is a just judge, though he, he saved Noah, out of all of that destruction, he saved one family. And, and he did the same with Lot and his daughters. He saved them among the wicked. And then verse 9, and this is kind of the key verse in this chapter. He says, then, since all this is true, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And so it's two sides to one coin. One side of the coin is judgment is coming. Man, and the ungodly are going to be judged. It's certain condemnation. But the other side is that the godly, those who have placed their faith in Jesus, they're going to be delivered. Both things are true. God is just. And he knows how to deliver, and he knows how to punish. And here's what we can do. We can trust him. No one that's on this side 
is going to end up over there. And no one that belongs on this side is going to end up over there. God is a just judge. And he will judge. It's going to happen. He's going to judge the unjust, verse 10, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. So we had the conduct of the false teachers, the certain condemnation of the false teachers. And now, again, just kind of rapid fire, Peter lists off the characteristics of the false teachers. First, he says they walk according to the flesh. Their, 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 their way of life is just fleshy. It's not spirit-led. It's driven by base, natural desires, right? It's just this lust of unclean. And I want to do what I'm going to do, and that's the way I'm going, and I'm not going to listen to the Spirit of God at all. They also despise authority. They're rebellious. They don't want oversight. They don't want accountability in their life. They're, he goes on and says, they're presumptuous and self-willed. This goes back, and part of the reason why we started in chapter 1 is that Peter said no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Well, that's not true of false teachers. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. Oh, I've got something here. Peter continues. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might than the false teachers... They, they did not, he says, bring a, a reviling accusation against them, the dignitaries, before the Lord. They're, they're prideful. They're cocky. And this is, he's talking about spiritual, uh, you know, the spiritual realm. And they're, they're flippant when it comes to spiritual warfare. And we see this. It's another common characteristic, it would seem, when it comes to false teaching is that they're flippant with spiritual warfare. There's a lot of teaching out there that would have you believe is you just need to get tough with Satan. You, you just get out there and you rebuke him. I'm, I'm telling you, Satan, get out of here. I'm just going to tell you where to go and how to get there. The book of Jude is one chapter, and that one chapter is, is parallel to 2 Peter chapter 2. They, they go in harmony together. And Jude says this, Michael the archangel dared to not bring a reviling accusation against Satan, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. Not even Michael, the archangel. You remember when, when an angel put the 185,000 Assyrians in one night? Okay, How Greater in power and might. Not even Michael. He was so presumptuous and prideful to say, I rebuke you, Satan. No, he says, I'm gonna let Jesus deal with you. And the Lord rebuke you. And so Peter says, these false teachers, that's a characteristic that they can have, that they're flippant with spiritual warfare. They're fleshy, they're rebellious, presumptuous, self-willed, and prideful. And now, beginning in verse 12, he makes comparisons to what they're like. And he says, but these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. They're brute beasts, just brazen, speaking evil of things they, have, they can't comprehend and understand. And Peter says, that because they operate according to the flesh and not the spirit, they, they live on this brute beast, this kind of animal plane. That's the reality they live in. They function by instinct. I, I want what I want, so I'm going to go after what I want. That's, you know, there's no holding back any of that, no self-denial. I'm just going to go and get what I want. And because they do, he says, destruction awaits them, verse 13, and they will receive the wages of unrighteousness. That, that word wages is impactful to me. They're going to receive wages. They've earned this. They're on this side. It's where they belong. And this is what they've earned. Okay? They're getting what they earned as those who count it pleasure. That word pleasure there is where we get our word hedonism. Maybe you're familiar with that. It's the pursuit of pleasure. That's, that's your, what guides your life, whatever's pleasurable, right? And so he says they, they, they pursue pleasure and they carouse in the daytime. That struck me because 
I remember back in the day when I caroused. I'm beyond that now, but I caroused at night. I mean, nighttime is the time to go carousing, right? But they're carousing in the daytime. They spend their day seeking pleasure. It's in the daytime. There's, there's sin openly. They're not hiding their sin. They're justifying their sin. I want what I want, and yeah, it's okay that I do. And so I'm going to plead for uh, money for a jet, and I'm going to tell you to write me a $100,000 check, and I don't care. And yeah, I'm going to justify all of this. This is their brute beast. And second comparison, their spots and blemishes. There's that word again, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. It's the Lord's desire, Ephesians 5 tells us, that his bride, the church, would be without spot or blemish. But the false teacher comes in and says, man, the Lord's trying to make you just this beautiful, purified, without spot and blemish bride. But they come in and they stain what the Lord is doing by their teaching. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. They're in bondage. The false teacher, he sees everything as an opportunity to satisfy self and to sin. I, I can't, they can't cease from sin. They're in bondage to it. Enticing, it's a fishing term. It means to bait a hook. I'm sure that this is something that Peter was well aware of. It's like to lure. They lure unstable souls, enticing unstable souls the false teacher is going to prey on those who don't have a firm foundation, who aren't quite so familiar with the truth. That's who they're going after. That's their target audience. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They're just in it for the money. They have a heart trained in covetous practice. J.B. Phillips said this, they have perfected the technique of getting what they want. Again, I, I really believe that we see some of this on the television when we turn on TBN. They have perfected the technique of getting what they want. And then verse 15, his third comparison, Peter uses an example of a, of a well-known false teacher who operated by greed. It says they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. What is this other way that's astray? It says they follow the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness. But he is rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Balaam is this kind of mysterious Gentile prophet. You can read about him in Numbers 22 and 23, 24. And you see, when the Israelites left Egypt and were making their way to the promised land, they got to this place called the Plains of Moab. The king of Moab sees this multitude, these millions of Israelites coming. And, uh, and he's like, man, I want these people cursed. I don't want them to take over this land. You know, I don't know what's going on. And so his name was Balak. And he says, I, I know about this prophet named Balaam, this Gentile prophet. Let's send for him, give him some money, and maybe he'll come and curse God's people. So they send a couple emissaries out there with some loot, and they say to Balaam, hey, would you come and would you curse? curse God's people. He's like, let me pray about it. Like, you got to pray about cursing God's people, right? And he's like, no, Lord doesn't want me to do it. And so they leave, go back to the king, Balak. Balak says, send a little more money, send some more impressive dignitaries to go ask him. They go ask him again. He's like, hey, would you go curse God's people? Let me pray about it. Nope. But you know, even if you didn't, you offered me, you know, a tunnel loot, like a house full of gold. I'd say no, wink, wink, you know, maybe, you know. And so these two dignitaries go back. They talk to Balak, and he said, man, even if you offered him all this gold, he's like, well, try it, you know? So they go back, offer him all this gold. He's like, you know what? The Lord just told me it was okay to go. <laughs> now that you came with all that money, uh, the Lord said it's all right. And so he takes off on his donkey, but on the way, and you guys know the story, the angel of the Lord stands in front of the donkey, and it just veers way out into this field. And he's like, come on, man. He starts beating on this donkey, gets it back on the path, and then, uh, you know, sure enough, they get to this embankment on one side, and the angel of the Lord stands right in front of the donkey again, and the donkey goes right into that embankment, just crushes his leg, and he's like, come on, man. He starts 
beating his donkey again. Then it comes to this crevasse where there's, there's no way to turn. And the angel of the Lord stands right in front of the donkey. And the donkey's like, I'm done. Just sits down. Balaam starts beating on this donkey. And the donkey's like, dude, why you keep hitting me? Don't you know I've been a good donkey for so long? And Balaam's like, well, I did it because he crushed my leg. Like, the, the most amazing part of that story to me is that he just, without missing a beat, just like starts talking to a talking donkey. <laughs> Imagine if you went home, right? And you're like feeding your cat, whatever. You know, hey, here's some warm milk. I'm like, I really want some tuna fish. Like, <laughs> you would run out the door. I got to get away from this talking animal, right? Or at the very least, you'd get your phone and start recording it, right? You wouldn't start a conversation with your cat. Balaam doesn't run the other way. He just continues on. He goes, he goes anyway. And after, he, he tries several times to curse God's people. It doesn't work. And so Balak's like, well, have him maybe go up and get this perspective. And, and maybe looking at the, at the camp of Israel from that, tries again nothing. Three times he tries, and he's unable to curse the people. So he tells Balak, I can't curse God's people but here's the way of Balaam. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's the, here's the wages on righteousness coming through. The training. You've perfected exploitation. I can tell you how to get them to curse themselves. I can't do it. I can't curse God's people. But you can sure get them to curse themselves. Get some of your little hotties down there, down to the camp of Israel. Have them flaunt their stuff. Get them to commit adultery. Have it lead to idolatry. And they'll curse themselves. That's what you can do. And so, like Balaam, they lead others into sin. They show others how to sin, lead others into sin for their own financial gain. And then the fourth comparison, he says, they're, they're wells without water. <laughs> we, wells are important, right? Especially in an arid land. If you're traveling, traveling through an arid region or you have a flock of sheep or you have something, you see a well, you're like, okay, that's what's going to bring sat. There's this expectation that's created. That's going to satisfy. That's what I need to be sustained. He said, no, they're an empty well. There's nothing worse than shattered expectations, right? You'd wish you didn't have the expectation to begin with at all. It's an empty well. He also said they're clouds carried by a tempest. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? There's storm clouds that, that bring darkness and destruction, and then they don't even rain. It doesn't even bring moisture with it. No satisfaction, just destruction, just harm, no health. And now, after these comparisons, verse 18, he describes the type of communication that these false teachers employ, the deception that they speak. He says, when they speak, they speak great swelling words of emptiness. Peter says, it's not that false teachers don't know how to speak. <laughs> these texts are very good at speaking. But when they speak, it's what they speak. It's empty. There's nothing, there's no, there's nothing to it. It's like cotton candy, right? Where you, you, you like look at it, oh, that's going to fill me up, but there's nothing there. Lots of charisma, great swelling words, but there's no truth. There's no substance to it. it they, they held out this promise, like, oh, this is going to be something, but it's just emptiness. There's nothing there. They also, not only do they speak emptiness, they appeal to human appetites. It says they allure through the lusts of the flesh. That's just sick, man. Alluring through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. They appeal to human appetite. Oh, I know what's going to get them to follow. They massage your ego. You're a good person. God wants you to have the best. They encourage promotion of self. Hey, this is all about you. What's best for you? Yeah, that's what I want to hear. They allure to the lust of the flesh. Verse 19, they also have false promises. It says, well, they promise them liberty. They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. They have these false promises. They're promising liberty. Here's freedom. Come get some freedom. 
but they're in chains themselves. They're slaves. They're slaves offering freedom that they can't give. And so Peter, as he finishes this chapter, he shares his conclusions about false teachers and the ungodly. He says, for if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are, and they are again entangled in them and overcome, the later end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. He says, it would actually be better. If you can wrap your mind around this, it would actually be better for them not to hear anything about Jesus than to hear something about him or to hear about him over and over and then just reject him altogether. Because the more that we have revealed to us, the more accountable we are. That's why the book of James would say those who are teachers are held to a higher standard. And there's, there's greater accountability there. But he says, ultimately, when people turn from Jesus, what they're doing is they're just reverting back to and revealing their true nature. He says in verse 22, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to wallowing in the mire. A dog returns to his vomit. Whew. So they, I, uh, years ago, a long time ago, Charity and I led a college group, and um, we were having this barbecue, fun day, volleyball, the sand volleyball pit out there. And so we, I load up the barbecue with burgers and then start playing volleyball. And I didn't, you know, um, living in the moment, you know, uh, the volleyball match is intense and the burgers are just getting cooked and cooked and cooked and cooked. And finally, I'm like, oh man, I, sorry, I got to take this next game out. I go check on, open the grill and they're just like, ding, 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 ding. I mean, it's not good, right? And so just take the spatula, just kind of shove them all off into the lawn right there. And the people's house we were at, they had a dog, I think his name was Buddy, not that that matters, but Buddy comes, and he's like, burgers, eats one, two, there's like 17 burgers, just one after, I don't know how he did it without drinking something, because they were like crispy critters, okay, eats all of this, I go put on fresh burgers, start from scratch, you know, and uh, while I'm doing this, he's like, it's not settling well with him, okay, and so he goes over here and vomits, scratches, you know, walks over here, throws up, goes across the lawn over there, threw up like 17 times, <laughs> just made a little deposit here and there. Okay, by that time, our burgers are done. I've been keeping an eye on them. Now they're just right, you know, a little pink in the middle, right? They're just perfect. Pull them off. We're eating. You're like, oh man, can you believe the dog just threw up, right? And then he's like, well, you guys are eating. I need some to eat. Oh, yeah, I put this over here. Eats this one. Eats that one. Eats this one. It's like, oh, it was bad the first time. There's no way it's better now, buddy. Dogs are going to be dogs, and sows are going to be sows. The true nature is going to come out, and that's what he's saying. For those who have had something true, revealed to them about Jesus, to reject that, they're revealing their true nature. Man, this warning, it's not a very, hey, day after Christmas message, you know, that's fun and exciting, that's, and then talking about vomit on top of it, right? But this is serious thing, and I think it's, it's well-timed as we head into a new year. We have to be watching out. We have to be listening to what Paul, to what Peter says. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, it's the final chapter that Paul wrote, this prolific New Testament author. He said, the time will come, and I think it's here right now, when they, Christians, those in the church, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers and they'll turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. It's happening now. And I think what the Lord would say is that the best way to recognize false teaching 
is to know what's true. It's to be familiar with this book. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is in this town of Berea, and after sharing the gospel message with them, he says this, the Bereans were of much more noble character than the Thess- those from Thessalonica. And here's why, because they searched the scriptures daily to find out if what we were saying was true. Now, I'm not super into New Year's resolutions. Uh, I don't think they're on biblical or any of that. It's just, it's not really my thing. But if there was a resolution, if there is a practice to put into your life this coming year, can I encourage you to have this book be a greater part of that? To, to, to have this prevention, tend your own soul, feed and tend your own soul and prevent the false teaching from taking a hold of you. Let's pray.